Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tom. I wanted to get you on. I, I wrote a book called Unequal Protection, in which, and the core of that book is the 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad Supreme Court decision. Right, a very famous case. Yes, and the, the case in which allegedly the Supreme Court ruled that corporations are people, which set up everything to Citizens United right now. And when I was doing the research for that book, I was in the Library of Congress and, and going through, and the National Archives, and going through the Stephen Field collection, the Morrison Remick Waite collection. Morrison Remick Waite was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time, Stephen Field, an Associate Justice. He was the Ninth Circuit Court Justice. And the railroads had thrown five or six or seven, I believe it was seven of them all together, from 72, 1872 to 1886, a series of what were referred to as the railroad tax cases to Stephen Field in the Ninth Circuit. In each case, Stephen Field ruled corporations are persons. The word person in the 14th Amendment means corporations as well as humans and kicked it up to himself in the Supreme Court. And in each case, the Supreme Court knocked it down, including Santa Clara, although yep. although the clerk of the court wrote otherwise in the head note. And what we found in the collection of letters from these guys was was letters from the railroad barons basically telling Stephen Field that if he would get corporate personhood for them, for the railroads, that they would support him in a bid for president in the election of 1888 or 1892. And the, they tried the same with Morrison Waite. They took him on, on a, a long trip out west and wined and dined him and several other of the, of the justices. The court had been completely corrupted by the railroads. And when I saw that you had written this book that was the book about the railroads at that, in that era... I wanted to get you on and learn everything I could from you. And, you know, most of my listeners are familiar with the stuff that I just was going through. So I'm pretty much done talking here. I want to learn from you. What what made the railroads and how did they get so powerful that in 1886 they were able to corrupt the United States Supreme Court? Well, you know, what, what we have to be careful of is the kind of corruption that takes place because it's really actually very... Um, reminiscent of many of the things going on today. What the railroads did in, especially the transcontinental railroads, they depended on the federal government to survive. Uh, the transcontinental railroads were built ahead of demand. Um, they were themselves very corrupt with insiders taking out the profits. And they were always in danger of bankruptcy, and they were always in danger of federal prosecution to take back many of the subsidies because they hadn't met the terms of the subsidy. What they needed was friends. Um, they needed friends both to stop competition from other railroads and to protect the things they'd gotten already. Stephen Field was one of the friends of the railroad. And by friends, they mean something quite particular. There's, there's no need to bribe Stephen Field. Um, there's no need to bribe many of these politicians. The way they define friendship is that they do them each other reciprocal favors. Right. Um, the railroad will take care of you. The railroad will give you uh, information which can be turned into money. Um, the railroad will, in fact, buy property from you. The railroad will give property to you. The railroad will do all kinds of things without expecting an immediate return. But what they expect is when the railroad's interests come up, you will protect the railroad. Stephen Field is a friend of the railroads. I doubt if you will ever be able to find a smoking gun to show that Stephen Field is bribed. But as you note, he is very close to all the railroad men. He takes railroad passes. He will, when they give him any sort of particular instructions, he will back off. He will be the, the paragon of rectitude. Right. But at other times, he is ruling. His rulings are inevitably in favor of the railroads, including when the Pacific Railroad Commission wants Stanford to testify about um, the payments of pol to politicians and judges by the railroad. Um, Field is the one who protects them, says they yep. don't have to testify. Now, who is Stanford? Stanford is Leland Stanford. Um, I teach at Stanford. Stanford's the one who um, founded my university. He's one of the big four of the uh, Central Pacific and Southern Pacific Railroad. And how did these how did these big four come to be the big four? They came to be the big four largely through luck. Um, what happens is is that in 1865, the federal government wants to build the Transcontinental Railroad, and anybody who knows anything about railroads realizes this is a very bad idea. 
there's no way that you can make money running a railroad between um, the Missouri River and the Pacific Coast. What the Big Four realize is there might be no way to make money running a railroad, but there's a lot of way to make money out of constructing a railroad, and there's a lot of way to make money out of financing a railroad. Mm -hmm. Their fortune comes not from running a railroad efficiently. Their fortune comes from insider construction contracts and from a kind of financing which one of their nephews later said um, should have put them all in jail. But it ends up making them fabulously rich, not from the railroad itself, but from companies connected to the railroad. And these were the first, you know, in 1600, uh, December of 1600, uh, Queen Elizabeth brought into being the British East India Company, mm -hmm. which was the first modern British corporation and came to basically run Great Britain. In fact, the Boston Tea Party was a revolt against that corporation in large part. These railroads were the first modern American corporations? Do I have that right? These, these railroads are the first large modern corporations, and they're not just the transcontinentals. What sets the transcontinentals apart? Eastern railroads are just as big corporations, even bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but the Western railroads have particularly close ties to the federal government. They get land grants. The Union Pacific gets bond guarantees. Um, they get aid in controlling their labor forces. There is no way these railroads would have survived in the 19th century without the active aid and participation of the federal government. So what they do, because the federal aid is so important to them, is they essentially invent the modern lobby, which is, I, I argue, it's the modern lobby is a creation of the Texas Pacific and the Southern Pacific struggle for federal aid and competition in the late 19th century. Wow. And which has, has uh, become a real pox upon us all. Uh, yeah, it has. <laughs> the, uh, to, what, to, to what extent, uh, let, let me rephrase this. I remember reading a biography uh, that was written back in the 1930s of John D. Rockefeller. And uh, it pointed out that in the, I believe it was the 1880s, 1890s, that he had uh, cut a deal with the railroads in Pennsylvania where they would refuse to carry uh, refined oil products, kerosene principally, from any of his competitors in exchange for his paying them, you know, a couple pennies higher than the going rate. Basically, you know, he, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And through this means, he put out of business hundreds of small petroleum companies in Pennsylvania and ended up with this huge monopoly. And then he started extending this practice into Ohio, only there it wasn't so much the railroads that he was buying off, it was the the uh, the the uh, the people who were delivering oil by by uh, what you call truck today, I guess you know in many cases horse drawn, whatever it was, or by barge, and is that kind of you know th that's basically building dynasty and an empire is that or or monopoly rather is that where we're at in the we have a minute left here is that is is that what the railroads brought us and is there some way to get out of that Richard White. Well, what, what the railroads brought us is the kind of practices that you talk about, and then it brought us anti-monopoly. I mean, one of the great neglected progressive reform movements in the 19th century, one full of faults. I mean, it's full of racism, it's full of all kinds of other things. But what it recognizes is that the, the point of the economy in a Republican or Democratic society should be to produce Republican and Democratic citizens. And they believe that, in fact, no private corporation should have the means or the ability to determine the outcome of economic competition between citizens. That's why they hate the railroads. Thus it's the Sherman the railroads could cut deals with people like Rockefeller. Right. Thus the Sherman Act in 1881. Right. Yeah, yeah, which turns out to be, um, you know, relatively ineffective, but the progressive era legislation will bring an end to many of these kinds of abuses. That's interesting. And, and yet they're back. Be, uh... they're, they're back. I mean, what I, I would say, I'm writing a book about a period where, in fact, you have a kind of laissez-faire capitalism. We then get regulated capitalism, and now we are back to laissez-faire, and it's no wonder that the late 19th century seems so much like the 21st century. Absolutely. And and I find it amazing that uh, I am, that Atlas Shrugged was all about the railroads. It's like let's bring it back, <laughs> Richard I White. A lot of readers, man. Yeah, man. there you go, <laughs> Richard White. His uh, his book, Railroaded: The Transcontinentals and the Making of Modern America. Thank you, sir.